Lion Sykes! ejected her sister-in-law, looking at the many-colored square. Why, well, Madden Bell Airwell, where do you get that pattern? I, I made it up, said Madden Bell quietly, quietly, but with unutterable pride. No! exclaimed Sophia incredulously. Did you? Why, I never seen a pattern all my life. Girls, come here and see what your Aunt Bell is doing. The three tall daughters turned back reluctantly from the stair. I don't want to listen. I don't seem to take much interest in patchwork, said one listlessly. No, no do I, answered Sophia. But a stone image would take an interest in this pattern. Honest, oh, Mother Bell, did you think of it yourself? And how under the sun and stars did you ever get up your courage to start in on making it? Land, look at all those tiny, squinchy little stains. Why, the wrong side ain't a thing but seams. The girls echoed their mother's exclamations, and Mr. Elwell himself came over to see what they were discussing. Well, I declare, he said, looking at his sister with eyes more proving than she could ever remember. That bear is Miss Whittingham's quilt that she got in the blue ribbon so many times at the country fair. Methanville's heart swelled within her, and tears of joy moistened her old eyes as she laid that night in her narrow, hard bed, too proud and excited to sleep. The next day, her sister-in-law amazed her by taking a huge pan of potatoes out of her lap and setting it on the younger children to peel them. Don't you want to go on with that quilting pattern? She said. I'd like to see how you're going to make them grapevine designs come up out of the corner. By the end of the summer, the family interest had risen so high that Methanbell was given a little stand in the sitting room where she could keep her pieces and work in odd minutes. She almost swept over kindness and resolved firmly not to take advantage of it by neglecting her work, which she performed with a fierce thoroughness. But when the whole atmosphere of her world was changing, things had a meaning now. Though the longest task of watching Miss Pales, there were the rose, the rainbow promise in her variegated work. She took her place by the little table and put the thimble on her knotted hard finger with the solemnity of a priestess performing a sacred rite. She was even able to bear with some of the dignity the extreme honor of having the minister and the minister's wife comment admiringly on her great project. The family felt proud of Aunt Methenbell as Minister Brown had said it would work as fine as any had seen, and he didn't know any but finer. The remark was placed replied verbatim to the neighbors in the following weeks, but they dropped it and examined in a perverse silence some astonishingly difficult tour de force, which Methenbell had just finished. The family especially plumed themselves on the slow progress of the quilt. Methenbell has been working that corner for six weeks come Tuesday, and she ain't half done yet, they explained to visitors. They fell out of the way of always expecting her to be the one to run on errands, even for the children. Don't bother your Aunt Math and Bill, Sophia will call. Can't you see she's got a tickling place on that quilt? She's got to a ticklish place on that quilt? The old woman sat up straighter and looked the world in the face. She was part of it at last. She joined in the conversation and her remarks were listened to. The children were even told to mind her when she asked them to do some service for her. Although she did but seldom, the habit of self efficient became too strong. One day, some strangers from the next town drove up and asked if they could expect the wonderful quilt which they had heard of, even down in the valley. After that, such vegetations were not uncommon, making the Elwell's house a noticeable object. Mithin Bell's quilt came to be the one of the town sites, and no one was allowed to leave the town without having paid tribute to its worth. The Elwells saw to it that their aunt was better dressed than she had ever been before, and one of the girls made her a pretty little cat to wear on her thin white hair. A year went by and a quarter of the quilt was finished. A second year passed and half was done. The third year, Methenbell had pneumonia and lay for weeks and weeks, overcome with terror lest she die before her work was completed. A fourth year and one that could really see the grandeur of the whole design. In September of the fifth year, the entire family watched her with eager and admiring eyes. Methenbell quitted the, quilted the last stitches in her creation. The girls held it up by the four corners and they all looked at it in solemn silence. Then Mr. Elwell smote one horny hand with another and exclaimed, By ginger, this is going to be a kind of fair. Methan Bell blushed a deep red at this. It was a thought that had occurred to her in a bold moment, but she had not dared to entertain it. The family explained the idea, and one of the boys was 
forthwith dispatched to the house of the neighbor who was chairman of the committee for their village. He returned with radiant face. Of course he'll take it. Likes not to have a get a prize, he says. But he's got to have it right off, because all the things are going tomorrow morning. Even in her swelling pride, Myth and Belle felt a pain of separation as the bulky package was carried out of the house. As the days went by, she felt absolutely lost without her work. For years, it had been her one preoccupation, and she could not bear even to look at the little stand, nor quite bear the litter of scraps which had laid on it for so long. One of the neighbors, who took the long journey to the fair, for that the quilt was hung in a place of honor in a glass case in agricultural hall. That meant little to Methenbell's utter ignorance of all that laid outside of her brother's home. The family knows the old woman's oppression, and one day Sophia said kindly, You feeling sore lost without that quilt, don't you, Methenbell? They took it away so quickly, she said wistfully. I hadn't hardly had one real good look at it myself. Mr. Elwell made no comment, but a day or two later, he asked how his sister how early she could get up in the morning. I, I don't know. Why? She asked. Well, Thomas Ratson has got to drive clear to the West Olton to see a lawyer there, and that is four miles beyond the fair. He said if you can get up so that you can leave here at four in the morning, he'll drive you over to the fair, leave you there for a day, and bring you back again at night. Methenbell looked at him with incredulity. Duality. It was as though someone had offered her a ride in a golden chariot up to the gates of heaven. Why, you can't mean it! She cried, palling with the intensity of her emotion. Her brother laughed a little uneasily. Even to his careless indifference, this joy was a revelation of the narrowness of her life at his, in his home. Oh, tie so much as to go to the fair. Yes, I'm hearing it. Go get your things ready, for he wants to start a, tomorrow, mo <coughs> tomorrow morning. All that night, a trembling, excited old woman laid and stared at the rafters. She, who had never been more than six miles from home in her life, was going to drive thirty miles away. It was like going to another world. She, who had never seen anything more exciting than a church supper, was to see the county fair. To Beth and Bella, it was like making the tour of the world. She had never dreamed of doing it. She could not at all imagine what it would be like. Nor did the extortions of the family, as they bade goodbye to her, throw any light on her confusion. They had all been at least once to the scene of gaiety that she was to visit, and as she tried to eat her breakfast, they called out conflicting advice to her till her head whirled. Sophia told her to be sure to see the display of preserves. See the, be sure and see the display of preserves. Her father, her brother said not to miss in inspecting the stock. Her niece said the fancy work was the only thing worth looking at, and her nephew said that she must be home on account of the races. The buggy drove up to the door. She was helped in, and her wraps were tucked about her. They all stood together and waved goodbye to her as she drove out to the yard. She waved back, but scarcely saw them. On her return home that evening, she was very pale, and so tired and stiff that her brother had to lift her out of the bodily, lift her out bodily, but her lips were set in a blissful smile. They crowded around her with thorough questions until Sophia pushed them all aside, telling them Aunt Methenbell was too tired to even speak until she had had her supper. This was eaten in a forced silence on the part of the children, and then the old woman was helped into an easy chair before the fire. They gathered about her, eager for the news of the great world, and Sophia said, Now come, I come, Nathan Bale, tell us about it. <coughs> Excuse me. Nathan Bale drew a long breath. It, it was perfect, she said, finer than any I ever thought. They got it hanging up in the in the very middle of a sort of closet made of glass, and one of the lower corners is ripped and turned back so to show what the seam's on the wrong side. What? So, asked Sophia a little blankly. Why, the quilt, said Meth and Bill in surprise. There's a whole lot of other ones in that room, but not one that can hold a candle to it, if I do say who don't, who shouldn't. I heard lots of people say the same thing. You ought to have heard what the woman said about that corn, Sophia. They said, well, I'd be ashamed to tell you what they said. I, I declare if I wouldn't. Mr. Ella, why did you think of that big off we've been hearing so much about? I didn't look at the stock. He turned to sister indifferently. That, pi that set of pieces you gave me, Maria, from your red waist came out just lovely. 
she assured one of her nieces. I heard one woman say that you could smell, smell the red silk roses. Did you go to any of the horses on our town race? asked young Thomas. I didn't see the races. What about the preserves? asked another. I didn't see the preserves, said Mesma calmly. You see, I went right to the room where the quilt was, and then I didn't want to leave it. It had been so long since I'd seen it. I had to look at it first real good myself, and then I looked to the other to see if there were any that could come up to it. And then the people begun coming in and I got so interested in hearing what they had to say, I couldn't think of going anywhere else. I ate my lunch right there too, and I'm glad as can be I did too. For what do you think? She gazed around with kindling eyes. While I stood there with a sandwich in one hand, didn't the head of the whole concern come right in, open the glass door and pin first prize right in the middle of the quilt. There was a stir of congratulations and proud exclamation, and Sophia returned again to the attack. Didn't you go see anything else? She inquired. Why no? said Methanville. Only the quilt. Why should I? She fell into a revere where she saw again the glorious creation of her hand and brain hanging before all the world with the mark of the highest approval on it. She longed to make her listeners see the splendid vision with her. She struggled for words. She reached blindly after unknowing superlatives. superlatives. I tell you it looked like, she said, and paused, hesitating. Vague recollections of the hymn book, phaseology came out in her mind, and the only form of literary expression she knew. But they were dismissed as even sac sacri sacrilegious, <clears throat> and also not sufficiently forcible. Finally, I tell you it looked real well, she assured them, and she stared that into the fire. On her tired old face, the supreme content of an artist who had realized her ideal. And that was the story of the bed quilt. Now, if only Disney or Hayao Miyazaki could make this film, that would be really nice. <laughs>